We have to calculate by direct integration the moment of inertia for a thin rod of mass capital M and length capital L about an axis that is located a distance D from one end. Now, one end of the rod would be this left end right here, and then the distance from that end to the axis of rotation, which will be right here at the origin, that distance is symbolized by D. So far, so good. Now, this rod is not a collection of just a few particles. It is a collection of basically an infinite number of particles. It is a continuous distribution of mass particles, and because it is such, we have to use this integral expression to calculate the moment of inertia. So we know that I is going to equal the integral of R squared dm. Now, for us to make sense of that equation, what we need to do is examine a tiny little piece of the rod essentially. So that little piece of the rod is symbolized right here by dx. It's basically the smallest sliver of rod that you could imagine. And the distance from that small piece of rod to the axis of rotation is going to be symbolized by r. But because we've superimposed our rod on an xy axis, we can also symbolize that distance by x. So once again, the distance from that little tiny piece of the rod to this axis of rotation located at the origin, that distance is actually equal to x in our little diagram. So we're gonna make a little substitution. That r is gonna be replaced with x. So far, so good, but we can see that we have an integral with a variable x, but then we're also integrating with respect to mass. So we want those variables to be the same. So in other words, we have to express dm in terms of x. And for us to do that, let's just step back and just talk about a linear mass density. Now, a linear mass density is basically going to be how many kilograms or grams per unit length we are dealing with. So it's basically just mass per unit length. And in this situation where we have this rod of uniform mass distribution, this will be a constant value. So in other words, if you looked at a piece of the rod this long, or if you looked at the rod in its entirety, and you took the length and put that underneath the mass, you would get a constant value. So what we're saying is that the linear mass density would be the mass of the rod divided by the length of the rod. Now, why is that useful? Well, because we are about to come up with the mass of that little piece of the rod. Now to understand that mass, what we're going to say is that mass is going to equal the linear mass density, so m over l, multiplied by a particular length. Now this should make sense dimensionally because if we multiply those two values, the lengths would cancel and we would be left with just mass. So we already symbolize the linear mass density as m over l. You might ask yourself, well, what's the length that we're talking about? Well, we're trying to get the mass of this little piece of the rod. And if you look carefully, the length of that little piece of rod is dx. That's actually what dx represents. It's the horizontal length of our tiny piece of rod. So we're gonna fill in dx, and this gives us the mass of that tiny piece of the rod. And because it's such a tiny piece, the mass itself would be tiny, and any tiny mass would be symbolized by dm. So this expression right here will give us the overall mass dm of our tiny piece of rod. And we're gonna be taking, we're making a substitution. So this value right here is going to be plugged in for dm. And that's gonna create a nice integral where our variable is strictly in terms of x. So we have the integral of x squared multiplied by our dm, which is m over l dx. Now m over l is a constant because the mass of the rod and the length of the rod is constant. So we can actually factor it out, leaving us with a simple integral of x squared dx. Let's go back to our diagram so we can understand the bounds for our integral. We need a lower bound and an upper bound. The lower bound is going to be the leftmost coordinate of the rod. So the coordinate of this point right here. We can see that the coordinate of that point would be symbolized by negative d. Notice it's negative because it lies to the left of the y-axis. So that's our lower bound. And then the upper bound is going to be the x-coordinate of the far right side of the rod. And this is a little trickier to see because we have this distance L, but that distance is not measured from the origin. Remember, when you're trying to look for a coordinate, you have to measure it from the origin. So we actually have to take the length L and then subtract off D 
And by doing that, that leaves us with this distance from here, from the origin, all the way to that rightmost point. So that distance there is going to be L minus D, and that represents the actual X coordinate of the far right side of the rod. So we'll fill that in as our upper bound. We are now ready to integrate. This, again, is a relatively simple integral. We can do a nice power rule by which we add one to the exponent to make it X cubed, and then divide by that new power. If we simplify that a little bit, we're just going to have m x cubed over 3l. And again, this is bounded from a lower bound of negative d to an upper bound of l minus d. So now we just have to plug in our bounds. We can keep the m over 3l factored out. We always plug in our upper bound first, so that's l minus d cubed. And then we subtract what we have when plugging in the lower bound, so that's going to be negative d cubed. Now, of course, negative d cubed is negative d cubed. So in other words, we could actually rewrite this as L minus d cubed and then minus and then drop the parentheses and make this a negative d cubed. That looks a little awkward, doesn't it? Because we're subtracting a negative, so we can just change that to a positive. And this is the final expression that would give us the moment of inertia about that, that axis that was located in the origin. Now, the question wanted us to confirm some things. It says confirm that your answers agree with table 2.2 for two different values of D. So we're gonna start with D is equal to zero. And if you look back at the diagram, if D were equal to zero, then basically we would be trimming off this much of the rod and our axis of rotation would be through the far left end right there. So let's actually plug in D equals zero and see what we get. There we have it. And now we just simplify. Inside the brackets here, we have L minus zero, which is L. So this becomes L cubed and then plus zero. So that's just L cubed. We can cancel a factor of L from the numerator and denominator, and this leaves us with ML squared over three. Now let's make sure that that does equal the moment of inertia for a thin rod where the axis of rotation is on the far left end. So here is that table, and right here we see that when our axis passes through the far left end of the rod, we end up with one-third ML squared, and that's exactly what we have right here. We have one-third ML squared. So that indeed checks out, and now we can go back and see what the other part is. We're gonna plug in L over two for D, but to get an understanding of what that means, that would just mean that the axis of rotation was right through the center of the rod. And if we go back to that table, when the axis of rotation is through the center, we should get 1 12th ML squared. So let's find out if that happens by plugging in L over two into this boxed equation here. Okay, and now we're just going to simplify this a little bit. Inside that first set of parentheses, you have one L minus half L, so that's just L over two, and that's cubed. You're actually adding another L over two cubed. So we can continue simplifying that. Let's cube the numerator, L cubed, cube the denominator, that's eight. So you have L cubed over eight plus another L cubed over eight. Of course, that's two L cubed over eight. And that's gonna have to simplify a little bit further. And indeed it does because we can cancel out a factor of L that gives us L squared. And then we also have 2m l squared over 24, but 2 over 24 reduces to 1 over 12. So that's kind of neat. We get 1m l squared over 12, and that again does match what the table gave us as 1 12th m l squared for when the axis passes through the center of that thin rod. So that indeed also checks out. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I'd greatly appreciate it, but of course, please don't feel obligated to do so.